Mary Ann Verdecchio was a 10-year-old from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She was raised by her aunt and loved to visit people in the neighborhood. Mary Ann disappeared on June 7, 1962. Her mystery was the last of three still unsolved cases to occur not just in the same building, but on the same floor over the course of four years. A woman, Mary Regan, was murdered, and two people, Marcella Crossy and Mary Ann, were never seen again. I'm Ed Denzel, and this is Unfound. The human brain is a pattern deciphering machine. This is the exact reason that if you've ever taken an IQ test, you aren't asked what the capital of Florida is, Tallahassee. Instead, you're asked to predict the next squiggly line in a series of squiggly lines. For missing persons, when we're trying to find connections between cases, we are essentially doing the squiggly line thing. Is this disappearance related to that one? Is there a pattern? And this isn't always an easy question to answer. Most prominently for Unfound, we've covered the disappearances of Cameron Remmer and Jackson Miller, two men who disappeared from San Francisco under similar circumstances. In fact, there are three other men just like them, Sean Seedy, Christian Hughes, and Sean Dickerson, who also disappeared from that city, within blocks of each other over five years' time. Maybe they're connected. Yet, I have to tell you my opinion. There's no pattern to say all five are related to each other, despite appearances to the contrary. Well, today you're going to get to hear about three females, and their cases happened over only four years and not just in the same city, and not just in the same building. Today, try to decide if there is a connection between the mysteries on the fifth floor. And now a summary of these three cases. These are partially brought to you by my friend Megan Lainez's website, charlieproject.org. Mary Ann Verdecchia, on school days, would come home and immediately get out of her uniform. She would then walk over to the fifth floor of the Martinique Apartments to visit a woman she knew, Jean Emery, who had a cat. That day, June 7, 1962, Jean sent Mary Ann out for cat food. Mary Ann came back, hung around for a few minutes, according to Jean, then left. The building manager allegedly saw Marianne leave and cross the street. She was never seen again. An investigation discovered that Jean was actually a prostitute who had clients going in and out all the time. Three years earlier, on November 19, 1959, Marcella Crossy, a 30-year-old who lived alone on the fifth floor of the Martinique, was last seen eating at the restaurant on the ground floor of the building. When Marcella did not show up for work the next day, an investigation started. There were no signs of violence or anything unusual in her place, and her diabetes medication had been left behind. She was never seen again. That investigation could not determine whether Marcella went back to her apartment or not. Not at the time or since then have police been able to connect her case in any way to this following one. Mary Regan, a 45-year-old wife, was found murdered in her apartment on the fifth floor of the Martinique on July 8, 1958. Her husband was the person who first came upon the scene. She had been strangled and seemingly moved from the bed to the bathtub. 
According to the news at the time, Mary would entertain other men when her husband was away. Yet, police tried to implicate Mary's husband as the murderer, but could not do so despite multiple interrogations and a polygraph. Like the two disappearances, this murder is unsolved. The official position of the Pittsburgh Police Department in 2022 is that all three are not related. The guests for this episode are the first investigator for the Marianne Verdecchia disappearance and Pittsburgh Police Department legend Therese Rocco and the filmmaker who has made a documentary about Therese and who also assists Therese with media relations, Sharon Leotis. Unfound news. It's been a long time, but the gang is getting back together again. Next Thursday, February 24th, 7 p.m. Eastern, live, Dr. Telesco's monthly show with me as a guest will start up for 2022. As usual, this will happen on the Fischler College of Education and School of Criminal Justice YouTube channel. We will be discussing the disappearance of... Evelyn Hartley. Next, memberships are now available to those who would like to get a little bit more from Unfound's YouTube channel. For the low, low price of $2.99 a month, you'll get daily update videos from me, the Unfound Now episodes early, a short preview of the interview for the upcoming episode, and a snippet of the Patreon blog. Please consider it. It's a heck of a deal. Finally, it's now official. Unfound is with Spotify. The biggest change is for those of you using the Podomatic app. Yeah, Unfound you will not be there anymore. Unfound. Other than that, Unfound the program will continue on as it has iTunes, for the past Pandora, five Audible, Podomatic, and a half Spotify, iHeart, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Deezer, and YouTube. Speaking of YouTube, on Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, please join us for the Unfound live show. Watch, ask questions, and give the show a thumbs up. Contribute to Unfound at patreon.com forward slash Unfound Podcast. You can also contribute to PayPal, paypal.me forward slash Unfound Podcast. I also need to give a huge shout out to all the people who have monetarily contributed using Super Chat during the live show on Wednesday nights. Thank you for watching and thank you for donating. The email address unfoundpodcast at gmail.com merchandise the books at amazon.com in both ebook and print form do not forget the reviews the website theunfoundpodcast.com and please mention unfound at all true crime websites and forums thank you a note before the interview starts this is not your usual type of unfound interview Yes, we discuss all three cases. However, please remember that Therese was only responsible for one of them. But to me, it made no sense to just cover Mary Ann's when the other two occurred on the very same floor within a very short time frame. I also have to admit, I really wanted all of you to hear from this amazing woman and was willing to alter the format just a wee bit to do that. I'm so happy to have on this episode of Unfound uh, two very impressive women. First of all, we have the former assistant police chief of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the first woman to ever have that position, Therese Rocco, and a woman who has assisted Therese in documenting her life, Sharon Leotis. Therese and Sharon, welcome to Unfound. Thank you, Ed. Let's start here for Therese. Of course, she is the main uh, subject of this interview today, of course, with these two missing women and the, the we're covering a murder. 
of course, very unusual for Unfound. Therese, let's talk about you. How did you become a woman? How did a woman like yourself become a police officer rising to assistant police chief in Pittsburgh in the 1950s? How did your career progress to being becoming that, to getting to that position? Well, of course, it was important to get a job in those years because there were no jobs and there was very, very little money in families and I needed a job. I was 18 mm -hmm. and I filled in for a temporary person in the missing persons department. I began to love the job of finding missing people. Huh. And did, could you ever imagine that? I, of course, you're talking about 18 years old, but maybe when you were um, 13, 14, 15, was that becoming a police officer on your mind, or did you have something Absolutely else for your life? Not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely oh. not. It only came about at that particular time of my life when I was 18, uh -huh. and that was it. Wow. I was young enough. When you, when you got into that position and you started working at 18 with missing persons, did you find that it was just something that went well with you or did it take you a little while to kind of grow into it? How do you remember that? I grew into it immediately. I loved it and I gave it my all. Uh-huh. Okay. And so at that point at 18, you said, I'm going to make my career... Uh, as a police officer, of course, we know you moved, you know, moved up the ranks, but that's when you decided that. But working uh, in police with police, yeah. police and, and doing police work yeah. is a very, very unusual and fascinating uh, responsibility. Sure. Now I have and, to. Uh, she, this is Sharon, and she yeah. did have her struggles. Believe me, this was yeah. the fifties, and oh, you know, yeah. it was a, you know. A lot of men found it very difficult to accept us. Yeah. They were always kind and sweet, but they didn't want us to uh, walk in, uh, in their shoes. Uh huh. Now, if you could tell me, what year would that have been uh, that uh, you, you started working in missing persons for in Pittsburgh? What year? About. Uh, in the 1950s, the early 1950s. Yeah. 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 Don't have the year in front of us. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in the early 1950s, yes. and and it's interesting, and if you you know it's detailed in her book, but uh, as young as she was, and of course a young attractive woman, the police detectives started to use her as decoys for mm. jobs. So that oh. was really something that she had to be involved in early mm. on, in addition to missing persons. Right. Yeah, they utilized me in all instances, yeah. sitting in theaters and. Uh, meeting up with people, men, and I had quite a bit of an experience in doing the genuine police work. Can, if I can ask, can you even estimate you, uh, when you joined the police force, how many other women were working as police officers in Pittsburgh? How many? I really don't know. There were, there were none. No. There were none. Uh, there were typically only some women in missing persons, yes. mm -hmm. although they weren't clerical work. Yes, but no police officers, female at that time. The wow. women were just basically used to do clerical work. Okay. All right, so you were one of the few women, uh, maybe the first woman maybe, to actually work in investigations in Pittsburgh. I would say I was. Wow, that's so impressive. Good for you. Okay. And, and we, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, we, it was 1944 that she started. We just okay. tracked our, <laughs> our dates backwards. All right, 1944. Okay, 1944, thank you. And listeners should understand um, uh, that this is like a group interview, and uh, Sharon has obviously worked with Teresa. So some of these uh, questions uh, we may come back to and, and, and dates and things come back to and uh, filling in some of the blanks here. That's totally fine. Okay, so you become a... Uh, in the missing persons in the 1940s and work your way up. So uh, then I guess once Marianne Verdecchia went missing, uh, you had been working missing persons for a while. Absolutely. Okay. And I had a lot of experience and that became my main object. Yeah. I wanted to find her. Uh, we never did. But, yeah. however, I worked that case to the bone. Right. Now, 
in, in of course, Marianne uh, did not disappear until the 1960s, so you had quite a few years under your belt before this happened. Um, to that point, if you can remember, uh, were there any other disappearances uh, that went unsolved, like Mary and Anne's has gone unsolved? No, not unsolved. There were mm. many disappearances which eventually were solved. Yeah. All right, and 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 Mary Ann's is that one that just I guess every police officer, if you're an investigator long enough, there's that one case that always sticks with you, and Mary Ann's is yours. Yes, and, and of course you have to understand it did receive a tremendous yeah. amount of publicity. Right, right, and the listeners should know that by the time everybody's hearing all of our voices, that I will have posted. I've gone back and found some of those articles, and I know that of course Sharon has sent me a lot of information as well. That we have a lot of uh, media files and things for this, so this episode, so uh, they'll get to see all the coverage that Marianne's disappearance uh, got. And this is, in fact, to the point with your book called Therese Ro uh, Rocco, you devote a whole entire chapter to her disappearance. Yes. Wow. Okay. And I will be linking to that. Now, to just to, to talk about, and these are questions, as the listeners know, I use an outline for all the interviews that I do, uh, no matter how old the disappearance is or, or whatever else. But when you found out about Marianne's disappearance, and we're not, we're going to, of course, leave a lot of these things out. We want people to go buy the book. So we're going to stick to some of the generalities, the real technical things. I hope people will go get the book. But when you found out about Mary Ann's disappearance, were you aware of the murder of Mary Reagan, Regan that happened in that same building and the disappearance of Marcella Crolci at the Martinique? Yes. You were yes. aware of those? I was totally aware of what had occurred in the Martinique apartments. Okay. And do you remember how that maybe affected your work on Mary Ann's disappearance? Did it? Well, uh, I really don't see any similarity. There was no similarity in these cases. Okay. However, I was curious. Yeah. I did consider what was involved in both of these cases. Mm hmm And you and the and you could find no connections between all three of them. No. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. Interesting. Let's talk a little bit about Marianne Verdecki. Of course, she was a, a little girl. And, uh, you know, her mother lived out of town. She was living with other family members. You know, what can you say about Marianne? What did you learn about her? And, and, you know, what went on that day, Therese? Well, first, let's describe her. She was a petite, sweet, little, innocent 10-year-old who, unfortunately, had a tremendous degree of freedom uh, to roam uh, the neighborhood. She, the most important thing that I can recollect is her big brown eyes and beautiful black hair. Mm-hmm. Mary Ann was left in the care of an aunt uh, who had become her legal guardian, and that was at the time she was only age five. Wow. Wow. And um, so that day on June 7th, 1962, uh, what did you learn uh, about her movements that day? Was it anything unusual from what she usually did? What did you learn about that? Well, I learned, first of all, that she it was her last day of school, and she was attending the Immaculate Conception grade school. She went home, changed her clothes, got out of her uniform, and put on red shorts and a white top. Then she went to visit Jean Emery at the Martinique Apartments. She was a lady friend mm. who she was more or less uh, associating with. Mm -hmm. And was uh, the way you remember it, uh, was this common for her to go over to Jean's? Yes. It was. It was common. Okay. She roamed, the child roamed, yeah. and it was common for her to attend. She knew Jean uh, through her Aunt Ruth. Mm -hmm. and Jean used to live next door to their house, and she got to know her pretty well. And, and had moved, and when she moved into the Martinique in April, married uh, the child would go there to visit, visit her. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, so this was close where Marianne lived and where Jean lived, pretty close or not? Oh no, it was close. It was about a five-minute walk. 
Okay. Now, uh, in of course, I've read uh, uh, your book, and I've read the chapter on Marianne's disappearance uh, a few times in preparation for this interview. But Jean had... Uh, where did Marianne go for Jean? Uh, she sent her, like, on a little errand. She went to Kroger's grocery store and bought some food back uh, to Jean, and then she left. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, she, and in the way you uh, investigated this, sometime after that is when Marianne disappeared. It's correct. Okay. Now, if you can remember... Uh, how soon after, was it like that evening that you got the call? Or was it like the next day that, hey, this little girl's missing. Uh, Therese, we need your help. You know, it was late at night that I received the call. And uh, I was picked up by uh, police officers who uh, transported me up to where our chief was. Mm -hmm. Okay. And did you, uh, I suppose you spoke to Marianne's aunt? Yes. Yeah. I spoke to Ruth. You spoke to Yes. Okay. And she was very much concerned because they had no idea where that child was. Mm hmm. And how long did it take you, um, if you can remember, or do we just go do it this way? When you finally did talk to Jean Emery, uh, the woman who where Marianne was, what did she have to say? Did you, did you when you first talked to her, were you suspicious of her? Do you even remember that? What were you thinking? Well, she didn't have much to say. She had very little to say because she didn't know. No one mm -hmm. knew where the child was at that time. Hmm. You know, all she had asked her to do was uh, go out and buy some cat food, uh, and she brought it back to her, and uh, she had pretty, pretty much left at that point. Right. Mm -hmm. was, yes. And there was a gentleman who was in charge of the Martinique. Right. And, and mm -hmm. he watched her. Go walk up the street, mm -hmm. and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. And there were two boys who also saw her. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Okay, so uh, just to recap this, Marianne, uh, like you said, got home from school, changed her clothes, went over to this building, uh, saw Jean Emery, who it sounds like this was a common thing, Marianne. Uh, there was something up about Marianne. Did Marianne like, did Jean have like a pet or something that Marianne liked, or was it something like that? Uh, yeah, Jean had cats. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Right. yeah. She would enjoy playing with the cat. Oh, she loves playing with the cat. Okay, all right. So maybe that's what brought her over there. Okay. Yes. So she, she goes was, over there. She was an adorable little girl that just did the normal things that children do, and yeah. she enjoyed playing with those cats. Mm hmm. The way you remember this uh, section of Pittsburgh at the time, Therese, do you, would you have called this a, a dangerous part of Pittsburgh at the time or a safe place? What would no, you say? Absolutely not. Pretty no. safe area. Pretty lob. Right. Lo yeah, very safe. Yeah. Very safe. Very yes. safe. I mean, children could move about all oh, around. Yes, children played on the streets and moved. Mm -hmm. They'd be the safe. Okay, very good. All right, so when you talk to Jean, so she just had no idea where Marianne went. In fact, maybe she didn't even realize there was anything wrong. You talked about these sightings um, of Marianne. Did you look into them? Did you find them believable? Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we went through the records, the volume of records uh, and reports over the last couple of days. You cannot imagine how many people, hundreds and hundreds, yeah. that she interviewed over the period of, of one year, and then, of course, the, the reports continued either after the year. What, what really was surprising to me, they looked into every car that was parked in that area. Mm. I saw a complete list of license plates. She tracked down every owner of the cars who were parked at the Martinique or near the Martinique. They got in touch with all of these people. Another example was a a, a little fair that uh, Mary used to attend. Mm. Marianne used to attend a little circus yeah. in the park. Uh, she had attended frequently mm. and there was a man who had a dog show. So they tracked this guy down in Missouri, mm -hmm. I think, and to find out if he may have taken mm -hmm. her. I mean, it was, it, 
extensive yeah, yeah. I, I guess I, and, I, and I realize that I guess all I'm asking Therese is there was there any of these I realize you checked on all sorts of leads and I, and that's great I wish police in 2022 would do that too but are, were there any sightings that struck you as more believable than others that that just didn't pan out the way you remember it Yeah, every every everything was uh, checked out. Mm-hmm. So nothing was revealed. Mm-hmm. It was just a situation where we weren't getting any. Yeah, and every mm-hmm. stone that they was turned over, it just nothing. Even reading these reports, you could mm-hmm. see that people were just making calls into the police station and saying, "Hey, I saw a little girl up, up in the hill yeah. district. She fits the description." So yeah, yeah it was exhausting. Yeah. I uh, just even reading them. So no, nothing really came of it. Yeah. Just okay. I can have a collection of that period of time where we were constantly, constantly on the phone uh, checking out people. It was mm. difficult, very yeah. difficult. And we have uh, we have a childhood friend of Marianne's with us today, and and Therese went to every home with children and talked to every child. Uh, this childhood friend was interviewed by Therese when she was a little girl. And so even that, they would check the homes. They would go through the homes to make sure she wasn't hiding there. Boy, it was just exhausting. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, we talked about this area of Pittsburgh being somewhat safe, but, you know, in reading about in, in your book, Therese, that you wrote in the chapter on Marianne's uh, disappearance, um, you know, it does say that the Martinique itself might have had a little bit of a reputation in that was Jean Emery a prostitute? Absolutely. She was. Yes. Okay. Jean Emery was a prostitute. Okay. But remember, women unfortunately found it very difficult to find employment at that yeah. time. Right. And there were many women who were prostitutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I have to ask, was Jean so forthcoming as to maybe give you, of course, if she's a prostitute, of course, there's going to be men going in and out of this uh, building at all hours, maybe of the day and night. Uh, was she no. able? Nope. You're, are you ready to ask her, did she reveal any men? No. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I asked Trace the same question, interestingly enough. The other day, and she said no. She did not no. give up any man no. because no. okay. That was part of her lively, that was her lively. All right, so uh, expose them. That was the beginning of getting them into trouble. Right, I, I'm sure it would. That's why I have to ask. Um, so <laughs> you know, uh, of course, but of course, you know, once again, you know, I've no, as you know, Teresa, I think you know, I've never been a police officer or anything, but it certainly would be nice. At the time, you know, maybe one of her clients could have been, you know, the perpetrator, but you still to the, nobody ever got the names of any of these guys who were doing business with Gene. Well, I wouldn't say that. Okay. I wouldn't say that we didn't. We, uh, we had our ways of investigating, mm-hmm. and if there was something we wanted, we got it. Okay. All right. So, all right. For the listeners, you just have to understand who Gene was, and it, you know, just does open up. Um, you know, a lot more possibilities when you have people who don't live there going in and out of the building. Just something to think about. Now, you eventually, though, we have to remember that Marianne uh, was living with uh, her aunt at the time, but you eventually did track down uh, Marianne's actual mother, and it's a very interesting how you did that. It's in the in the uh, chapter, but um, you know, she was considered a suspect. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Why that was. Because of Marianne was abandoned. Yes, of course, we considered her uh, involved, and uh, we did all we could to make that determination. Mm-hmm. Okay. We thought she may have wanted to, to get her daughter back. I wouldn't, we weren't looking at her as a, a person who committed a crime, mm-hmm. but we were looking at the situation as a mother who wanted to get her child back. Mm-hmm. And when you eventually did uh, track her down, and she just wasn't uh, an hour away, uh, as the listeners uh, hopefully will get the book uh, and find out she was in an entirely different state, um, w- were you able to rule her out as a suspect very quickly, or did that take some time? No, uh, we didn't look at, look at the situation as a suspect. Mm-hmm. We knew she was a mother, 
And uh, we waited until she came to uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah. And uh, we questioned her. Mm-hmm. So you, 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 we read through the questions yeah. uh, yesterday, mm-hmm. and it was a very thorough investigation, the questioning period between the mother and the father the at the same the time. Father, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Alcoholic. Yeah. And, uh, he didn't have any concern or uh, mm-hmm. for interest. The child. No, no interest. No. Okay, so I guess what we're saying, I guess what we're saying is once she, maybe there was a suspicion she might have come and gotten her daughter from Pittsburgh, but after talking to her, did you rule that out? Oh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. She wasn't in a position to take that child. Okay. And Ruth was genuinely the woman that took care of her and was more like a mother to that child. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's move on to this, and of course, this is the next part of uh, the outline that I'm doing uh, that I created for this interview with both Therese and Sharon. We want to talk about this guy. His name is William Dozer. Um, Dozier. Dozier, thank you. Uh, he was the building manager of the Martinique. Uh, do you remember talking to him, Therese? Oh, yes, absolutely. Okay. He Ma- worked in the apartments, and uh, we talked to him, mm-hmm. but he was in she had nothing to do with anything that involved this mm-hmm. child. Yeah, you know, I want to ask you about that because, uh, of course, there have been, you know, as with the internet these days, there's a lot of people always talking about a lot of things. You know, a lot of people that have come across Marianne's disappearance, maybe from your book or the Charlie Project or whatever, you know, they, they've certainly um, talked about him a lot. But as you, the investigator, at the time in 1962, you ruled him out as being uh, a possibility in Marianne's disappearance. Yes, uh, if we had a slight uh, supposition in terms of maybe they could be involved, we uh, we investigated. We did polygraphs. Okay, and I sir, I want to talk about the polygraphs before we're done here. So you got to talk to him, and and you'd already told me he actually said he saw Marianne that day. Yes. Okay. Uh, and he saw her um, leave the building by herself. Yes, he okay. saw her at approximately two thirty p.m. Mm. Okay. Looking out, he watched watched her walk off the street. Okay. When okay, uh, when you finally did get to talk to him once again, if you can remember, Sharon, of course, if you can uh, maybe help with this uh, answer as well, when. He told you that, yeah, I saw her walking down the street in a particular direction. When you ended up going back and talking to Marianne's uh, aunt, uh, could, did she say, you know what, Marianne could have been headed here, she could have been headed there. Was she able to offer any idea of where Marianne could have been headed? No. Well, the assumption was she was headed home. Her childhood friend uh, who's mm. with us and knows that direction because she walked those streets when she was young, and she said, yes, yeah, she was bombed to Moorwood, and that would have indicated that she was headed home. And she was seen by two boys who knew her, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and they commented on the fact that she had been up there walking. Right. Mm-hmm. And they were neighborhood friends as well, right. you know, and they, mm-hmm. they had seen her. They And I said this. I asked Truth, how credible was it? She said it was credible to interview these two boys. They had seen her get picked up in a vehicle on the uh, Millville Avenue Bridge. Millville Avenue Bridge. Wow. So somebody's. So when you track these kids down, they said that Marion got picked up by a car, in a car. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And um, I guess being that this disappearance is still unsolved, sixty years later. I guess you were never able to track that vehicle down who that might have been. Oh, no. No. Wow. Nope. Wow. Um, the way they explained that to you, Therese, did it sound like Marianne got in willingly, or was she, I guess we would use the word, abducted? I think she got in there willingly. Willingly? Yeah, we, the way it was described by these young men, young boys. Okay. But he, they didn't assume any problem there that she didn't mm. resist and she was a feisty little girl and if she didn't want to get in she didn't have to mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now we wondered that as well a lot of the reports from aunt ruth uh some of the other neighbors who knew her said we can't imagine her getting in a vehicle but then you know as we discussed it okay if something was offered to her 
dead. Yeah. How do we know that she couldn't have to entice right. her to get in? Right. Well, we uh, as as the listeners know, we don't do too many th- much theorizing or not. All right. I, I'm just I'm just wondering, but being that these two young men, uh, these two boys were witnesses. You know, of course, it would make a big difference between her getting in willingly and her being forced in. You know, of course. All right. So. Very good. All right. Thank you. Now, moving up many, many years to 1991, even though that's still over 30 years ago, um, there was this. Uh, I have to ask, Therese, were you still on the force in 1991 or, or not? Yes. I you were. Okay. So you then know, uh, might have been intimately involved in this uh, rumor. Uh, the case was reopened in 1991 about this uh, minister. Who might have been involved? What can you say about that? Well, the case was reopened by Baldwin Police because of a qualified lead they received to search a local church's property. The parking lot of the church was excavated looking for Mary Ann's body. They did not find anything. Hmm. What, uh, that was a rumor, that was a report, and that was the purpose of that occurring. Yeah. Your opinion 30 years later, now in 2022, uh, do, what is your opinion on that matter? Any, Do you lend any credence to it, or do you think it's just some uh, rumor that, that nothing? Well, at the time, you know, you looked into everything, mm-hmm. and uh, I considered it had to be looked into further. Um, well, it's just, at, the at the time, and we asked, actually spoke to a... Uh, uh, an adult now, uh, a woman, you know, a senior, and she was friends with uh, boy to uh, young boy, young men who associated with this minister. Mm. So we, we pursued that in the last couple of weeks as well. And she said that she always had a, just a strange feeling about their connection to this minister. So when she was driving by in 1991 and she saw that parking lot being excavated, she said, he did it. I know he did it. In her mind, that's what she said. So she, she said that feeling came back to her, mm-hmm. you know, from when she was associated with these young men. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say, but Treese has always told me that the lead that they, Baldwin Police received was extremely qualified. And mm-hmm. that's what we have to go on. Right, of course. I know Treese has to go on that. I would just, I'm just asking in retrospect, is this something that you still think is a serious lead in her disappearance, or do you think, uh, have you now since dismissed it? Well, I think she's still concerned. All right, sure. I, 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 she, I think Therese can answer that. I'm just asking her opinion yeah. on the 91, 1991. And everything can, can develop into the lead, mm-hmm. especially buried down into the earth. Yeah, okay. Now, and that's our concern, and, you know, was she buried there? Was the investigation thorough enough? That's what mm-hmm. Therese always wondered. Um... So yeah, but, okay. but you 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 always have that. Well, what could it? Would it? Could yeah. It okay. Well, let me ask you this then. Maybe if you can remember back to 1962, when you were, of course, and we know you worked on it. Once again, I hope people get the book and read the entire thing, and of course, very especially the Marianne Verdecchia uh, chapter. At the time when you were investigating it very hard in 1962 into 1963 and onward. Did the allegations that a a minister, a priest, anybody of the cloth could have been involved, did that ever even come up in back then in your initial no. investigation? No. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. So that is Marianne's disappearance. It's still unsolved. And uh, it's probably one of the, given that I'm originally from the Pittsburgh area, it's probably one of the uh, more, one of the longest unsolved missing persons cases maybe in western pennsylvania it's very possible um therese once again being that uh you know we don't do theorizing on the program but rarely do i have the actual investigator on the program do you have any uh opinion on what happened to marianne at all all these years later What does your, you know, you're a police officer for a very long time. Obviously, she very vanished. well respected. Yeah. Vanished my belief, and, and which could be not accurate. Yeah. She was killed. 
Okay. Okay. All right. So that is the disappearance of Marion Verdecki. And I want to once again tell all the listeners that we've only ch- covered this in the most general terms. You're going to hear, uh, you're going to read in the book where um, how Therese and others uh, were able to track down her mother and th- that process and all of the footwork they did. And um, Therese writes about a lot of her feelings at the time. And, uh, you know, all, all the procedures that, of course, go, still happen today in missing persons cases. But in 1962 uh, terms, I, I found it very interesting, maybe especially since I'm originally from the Pittsburgh area. So let's move on to this. And I want I, I realize that, Therese, you're not the I don't I don't think the main investigator on these, but I think we should touch upon these because they happened seemingly in the same building or of a person who was living at the building at the time. I just want to ask you again, uh, just to remind the listeners, when you got involved in Marianne's disappearance in 1962, did you know that the murder of Mary Regan happened in the same building? Yes, I did know that. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, and if you could just uh, pass along, what are some of the general facts regarding Mary's uh Mur- now, we have to say, murder. She was found, and she was murdered. What are some of the general facts, if you can tell them to the listeners? And Sharon, you, of course, you can help, too. Sure. Yes, she was, found, she was found dead by her husband, and she was in a bathtub. Hmm. Okay. Um, when you... Um, started working on Marianne's case, did you have any... Uh, now, you said, already stated in this interview that you do not think these are all related, but when you started working on Marianne's disappearance, did you track down the investigator from that murder? Do you remember talking to this person and, like, exchanging yeah. notes? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. A- anything in particular uh, that uh, that maybe sticks out to you all these years later? Uh, once again, I realize it was not your, um, you know, your case, but anything that, 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 that strikes you now? Well, there were approximately 75 uh, people who were questioned. Wow. Nothing, nothing came out, got them, mm-hmm. came about. Mm-hmm. Do you happen to know, uh, once again, uh, I, I'm I'm not uh, I've never been a police officer, but I do know how many times husbands are charged with their wife their their wives' murders, uh, and a lot of um, boyfriends are suspected in disappearances. Uh, is your is your impression they took a long hard look at the husband in this, and and what do you think about it? has the husband, in your opinion, been dismissed as her murderer? Evidently, there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay, so... And we have to remember that Mary Mary's murder happened in 1958, four years before Marianne went uh, missing. And, of course, Mary Mary is a uh, an adult. Uh, Marianne is a, a little girl. So, you know, it, I, I, I maybe agree with you, Therese. It's hard to connect uh, those two in any meaningful way. But she was murdered, and her husband or nobody else was ever charged or anything. But it's in the same building. Now, right. that, that's what's so interesting that all of these murders and or uh, disappearances happen in the Martinique. In, in Martinique. Right, which yes. is you know, unusual. unusual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah, I... Know, and another thing, I don't forget, if, uh, if you know or not, they all lived on the fifth floor. Jean lived on the fifth floor. Oh now, of course, gosh. Jean moved in much later. But, yeah. you know, um, uh, Mary Regan was on the fifth floor. And then, of course, if we talk about the disappearance of Marcella Krulz, uh within this interview, she lived on the fifth floor. All on the fifth floor. I didn't know that. The listeners should know. Yeah. I'm just finding out about this right now. That is crazy. Yep. Oh, my goodness. Uh-huh. Wow. Um, in your experience, of course, Therese, with your vast experience as an investigator, had you ever, have you, did you before or since ever encounter anything like that? So many bad things happening in a building like that. No. Nothing, nothing even close to it. I think people are more concerned and more cautious in their way of living today than they were in those days. Mm Mm-hmm. That was back at a time when people left their doors unlocked and, and left yeah. their keys in their car and all that. 
yeah. and we were saying that probably in that time it was probably month to month rentals, you know, that sort of thing, and that's why it was so transient. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Lit, all right, so we have this murder that is still unsolved. Once again, I want to remind the listeners, Unfound is an, really only a missing persons program, so you're not going to find Mary Regan's uh, case on NamUs. You're not going to find it on the Charlie Project. It's, it's an actual murder. But let's move on to the other disappearance that we're not saying it happened in the Martinique, but Marcella was certainly living at the Martinique. Um what do you remember about that? Of course, this is now in your department, even though you were not uh, the person responsible when she went missing in 1959. Um, when Marianne went missing, did you get to speak to that investigator? Of course, probably in your same... Did you speak to Marcella's investigator? Yes. Yes, okay. I spoke to all of them. We investigated every individual that was even remotely uh, involved. Yeah. I, I, now... Is is there any reason to believe she even disappeared from the uh, Martinique at all? Yes, she did. She did. Okay. What do you remember the investigator uh, telling you about Marcella's? Did he or she ever give you an opinion on what might have happened to Marcella? Do you, do you remember? Do you remember? No, she in 1959. Yeah, yeah. She was last seen at the restaurant located inside the Martinique. Oh, this is oh, this is a restaurant. See, this is something that's not in my notes. There was a uh-huh. restaurant inside the Martinique. Sure was. Huh? Was it? Uh, yeah. Maybe you can explain that to me a little bit. Uh, Therese was like on the first floor, and everybody lived above. It was sort of an adjunct building uh, that was attached to it, and mm. it. Um, uh, she, so we almost think that it may have been built as a hotel early on, because why oh. would it have a restaurant in there? Yeah. So, yes, it did have a restaurant. Now I think it's a pizza shop. Pizza oh, shop. okay. So, oh. yeah, there is a restaurant there. So she dined frequently in the restaurant. And we were looking at Treats. Treats actually has a foul on Marcella. Yeah. And we were reviewing that last week. And um, from what we understand, she would have a gentleman friend who would come in, and he was questioned after her missing uh, about, uh, you know, the disappearance. And, of course, you know, he didn't know anything, but he had, you know, he had had frequent, he frequented the restaurant with her for drinks and dinner. Wow. Okay. So I didn't know that. I, you know, it, it sounded to me when I've read about this, I don't never put it together that the restaurant was connected to the Martinique. Martinique. So I guess... All these are connected, uh, can be can be connected to the building itself, and they all lived on the fifth floor. How crazy. I know, um, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, once again, just to ask you again, Therese, once again, if you can remember, the, the lead investigator, whoever he or she was, did this person ever give you an opinion on what probably happened to Marcella, I mean, in their work? Do you remember? Well, yeah, she, uh, I believe... Well, they, yeah, a lot of people surmise that she just walked away, but uh, I'm just I, I'm all I'm asking Marcel, uh, all I'm asking Teresa when, when the investigator did the investigators at the time, her coworkers ever offer an opinion as to what probably happened to her, to the best. Well, guess. for one, one thing, she was diabetic. Oh, she had a problem. She had a health problem. Mm-hmm. And, uh, when she left her apartment, she left all her belongings behind. Yeah. And her, in- and and her, her insulins, that's it. Yeah. Okay, so we might think that uh, she went and ate and I, I maybe never went back to her apartment at all and walked off. You know, a lot of different things uh, could have happened. I and mean, in fact, in maybe some ways, it's kind of like Marianne's. If we're to believe that Marianne was seen walking away from the building and disappeared, it sounds maybe like Marcella was walking away from the building and disappeared. So we, we just don't know. All right. We, just to interject something else, Ed, on this case. Please. Uh, on November 25th, this gentleman, and I don't know if I can use his name or not, but he went to the restaurant. It was called the Belvedere Restaurant. And this is after she was missing. He went to the restaurant, and he was asking around about her being missing. So we thought that was a, a little odd, too. Why would he... No, why would he return to the restaurant to ask about her, knowing she was missing? Mm-hmm. 
Not sure what to, to make of that. And, and the listeners just have to remember, although, Therese, you were in the missing persons report, uh, department, Marcella was not uh, one of your cases. Right, but right. we do have the formal report yeah. in our hands. Okay. I'd like, uh, uh, yeah. Um, did you, uh, Sharon, did you send those reports to me, or could you, or are we allowed to make them public? Do you know? No, we're not. Okay. Teresa will answer that. <laughs> yeah, Teresa says no way. Okay. All right. Got you, Teresa. All right. I try. Well, Teresa, I had to ask. You know, I had to ask as a reporter. I got to ask. You know, you've, Teresa, you've talked to enough reporters over the years. You know how uh, picky and nebby we can be. Oh, I know all about reporters. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So those are the three. And I just want to ask you again, in your opinion, Therese, the way you look at these three unsolved cases, they are not connected at all. At all. No. Okay. No. All right. Um. All right. So maybe, maybe they are. Maybe they weren't. Now you brought up this, and this is once again in the outline. Um. You already brought this up about polygraphs. What can you say about polygraphs uh, back at that time? You used them. You know, how do you feel about them? Were they helpful in Marianne's uh, disappearance at all? Well, we relied on them very, uh, very much. We relied on polygraphs, and and uh, they were at the time the name of the game. Mm-hmm. How many people, if you can remember, how many people would you say you gave lie detectors test to regarding Marianne's disappearance? Would you say it's more, less or more than 10 or 20, 30? I would say about more than 30. Wow. That many. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And yeah, I had a superintendent at the time who was very, very much concerned about everything at Gilmore and, uh, we were able to do what we wanted with uh, that case. Mm-hmm. And I can imagine that, Therese, just looking over the volume of reports and the people who you question, I can imagine that you did do that many polygraphs. Yes, we did. Yeah. Okay. All right, so polygraphs were used uh, in Marion's. We talk about lie detector tests uh, a lot on Unfound. We know that they are not, of course, um, they can't be used in court. However, sometimes they can lead investigators to go in a particular direction. They're, they're a tool like any other. All right, so you, you, you polygraphed a bunch of people, but Marianne is still not uh, found uh, 60 years later. Let's move on to this. Uh, maybe I should uh, – may, let's talk to you, Sharon, being that you've um, been a part of this conversation. Uh, and I know this is not on the line, but I don't think this is a very tough question. Sharon, how did you get involved? How did you first meet Therese? Why did you get involved in, in helping her so much, even to the point, of course, you're, you know, you're assisting in this interview. What compelled you uh, to, to work with Therese? I had a very, very close friend who has since passed, and he was a cousin to Therese, and he... When I saw him one day, he told me that she was writing her memoir, and I had never met her. I really didn't. I've heard her name. I knew about her, and I said, you know what? That's interesting because I have been involved in video work for a good portion of my career, and I said, I've always been looking for a candidate to do a documentary on, and I said, do you think she would be interested in speaking with me? And he said, yeah. He said, let's wait till she gets her book published, and um, you take, you know, you read it, and uh, let's let's start that conversation. So, unfortunately, he passed before uh, I got to meet her, huh. but ironically, a few weeks after he passed, I happened to see her in a local restaurant, which was just unbelievable. I recognized her her from some photos and I approached her and uh, talked to her about it and she was very interested and I don't know if she completely understood the full scope of a documentary but it mm. was it was terrific we got to uh, interview a lot of individuals who she had worked with in her career including Cyril Weck wow. uh, you know uh, Sheriff Mullen who is the, the Sheriff mm. of Pittsburgh uh, mm. a lot of uh, women who are very successful now who are chiefs of police involved in the police uh, force who really she was their mentor and role model in their career and they credit Mm. so much to her yeah what year would this have been that this all happened we we worked on the documentary from uh, 2017 
through 2019, and we premiered it at the Heinz History Center downtown. They were very interested in it when I approached them. We had a fantastic evening of 500 people attended this, and uh, wow. we brought her up on stage at the end and had a, a very wonderful interview, mm -hmm. and she was able to uh, sign her books at the end of the evening. So it was, it was just, mm -hmm. and you know what? It was a tribute yeah. to I wish I could have gone. who really had never... I think received the accolades that she truly deserved, mm -hmm. and I think that's why everyone was in there in force. And the police chief showed up that night. Uh, the the uh, Pittsburgh Police Video Department showed up that night. She it was really a, a wonderful evening for Therese. All right, so you've so Therese, you and uh, Sharon have known each other for about five years, then. Five or six years. Yep. Five yeah. years. Okay. How does that feel, Therese? You know, you um. You know, you started your career in the 1940s working on uh, very high-profile cases, probably the most high-profile high profile missing persons case in Pittsburgh history, Marianne Verdecchia. You know, you retire at some point, but then uh, a woman like Sharon uh, comes along at some point and says, you know what, I'd really like to make a film uh, about all the great work that you've done. You know, how does that make you feel, Therese? Well, I'm very honored. I feel very honored. Uh, I always did what I had to do and never looked for accolades, but uh, believe me, uh, I appreciate uh, the concern that I'm being given, and mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for this young woman. Yeah, okay. Very grateful that she has come into my life. Yeah, okay. Uh, let's, let me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you, Therese, a little bit more, maybe more about just the job of police work, and uh, and I'll just read it. You know, I understand it's estimated that you and your team investigated approximately 45,000 missing persons cases during your entire career, finding thousands of those individuals. What are the keys to being a good investigator? Liking your job, wanting your job, developing an interest in what you're doing, and make and, and secure up good contacts. And the mm -hmm. most important thing, never give up. Never give up. You know, Teresa, I don't know. That's a very uh, it's, it's great advice. Uh, I don't know if you know this, Teresa, but just this, um, and I don't know if I've told Sharon this either. But, you know, I know we've had some, a uh, uh, lot of emails back and forth, and I, I know that I've given you some of my, you know, my resume and everything, but I have started speaking to uh, criminal justice majors at some schools in Florida. And of course, because my dis, my, uh, you know, my experiences in missing persons cases, I've started talking to these young people, you know, 20, 21 years old, criminology ma majors, sophomores, juniors, seniors. And, you know, I'm trying to help them uh, learn about investigating missing persons cases. And, and I can tell you, certainly I'm going to be adding to my presentation that I got to talk to you, uh, Therese, and, you know, and what you've had to say about all the great work you did. 45,000 missing persons cases uh, does it see, Did it seem like that many, Therese, while you were doing it? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. It was just a continuing, continuing process of a job. Mm -hmm. And she had a team. That's what she yeah. always uh, gives credit to her team. And she said, I couldn't have done yeah. this without the support of my employees. Yes. Yeah. Was this something that, uh, and you talked about how you started doing this was when you were 18 years old. Was this something like when you started doing it, it was like, you know what? I think this is what I was meant to do with my life. Is that how you felt about it? Absolutely. Yeah. What do you think, you know, looking at yourself, uh, your own qualities, your mind, your abilities, what do you think it was about yourself that, that, that you know, made you go right into this? Because as you know, a lot of people, you know, that would not be the thing for them. What, what was it about you that, that, that you made it work so well together with the job? Uh, it was unusual, uh, even when I was going to school. Uh, uh, I just had to dig into everything and know everything. And I believe that that's part of the, the, of, the, of, the, of the thing that makes you what you are. Mm -hmm. We actually, and she, was, she became very visible within the city, too, Ed, because once a child did go missing, she was on, the reporters would be in her office, she would be on TV. So really, she was, mm -hmm. I always say to audiences that she was the, uh, 
the Amber Alert before Amber Alert was there. <laughs> the Therese Alert. Yeah. <laughs> the Therese yeah, so Alert. She was Amber Alert right at my office. Yeah. Uh-huh. There with the camera. And the, yeah, she yeah. was up there. And just to go back, too, about you being in front of uh, some criminal justice uh, yeah. students, we spoke uh, at Penn State. She's spoken at Penn State. Wow. Duquesne for criminal justice. These, these young students were just amazed yeah. at what who she was, what she accomplished. And she also taught at Carlo uh, College. She was an instructor in, during her career for criminal justice. Huh. How did you like doing that? How, how do you like the, uh, you know, being, of course, going all over the streets of Pittsburgh with these investigations? How did it feel to be in a classroom for a change, Therese? I loved it. I loved it. And what really, really impressed me were some of the smart answer uh, questions that these yeah. young people would ask. And that's when you know you're accomplishing something. Mm-hmm. And yeah. working with the History Center, just a little side note, when we were working with the History Center of Pittsburgh, John Hines History Center, they had actually done their research, and they were the ones to inform us that she was the first assistant, female assistant police chief in the country. We didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's so impressive. So impressive. Let's Maybe let's, uh, Therese, allow me maybe to switch this uh, question around a little bit then regarding how you know eventually you would be the person that reporters can talk to how can the media do a better job once again your experience how can the media do a better job of re you know reporting on disappearances whether that is like new ones that are happening right now or you know old ones like Marianne's what what can we do better what has been your experience you know dealing with media in missing persons cases well being very very open and uh, not a, not um, omitting any necessary uh, comment or, or 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 advice, mm-hmm. and really being open. Mm-hmm. Open is the word. Yeah. How how do you think your relationship was with Pittsburgh media over the course of your career? Oh, I I think they were always fair with me. Mm-hmm. I can never complain about them. Mm-hmm. They always gave me a yeah. fair shake. Yeah. He actually uh, was called in when one of the top broadcasters in Pittsburgh, his daughter went missing, and boy, she, wow. he was the first person you called. And it was just a temporary missing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like a little runaway. But he but he, so a lot of respect there. He, he was yeah. on the phone with you immediately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Who was that? You know, I, I, like I said, I, I lived in the Pittsburgh area until 1998. Who, who was that? I don't even know. It, it was Bill Burns. Was it? Mm-hmm. His daughter. Uh-huh. Well, he worked. Yeah, it was. It was. She went missing. Just briefly, you know, a yeah. young, a young girl. He didn't know where she was. Yeah. Oh my gosh! She was an independent little girl at that time. I know, what, way before she ever appeared on TV with him. She went missing as a yeah, as a teenager. Missing, yeah. Just a little. They probably. I don't even know where they found her. Was she in the neighborhood? I didn't yeah. Know. Somewhere. Yeah. yeah. I did not know that. Well, uh, Therese, you know, I remember. I'd go back to the days of Ray Tannehill. Bob Kudzman doing the weather, Paul Cannon, you know, back in yeah. all those, you know, that's what I grew up on watching TV out in Leechburg, Pennsylvania. So, um, so Bill Burns' daughter, I never knew that. That's so interesting. I did not know that. Okay. Well, all right. Um, I'm she just, was upset, but she was missing for a few hours. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, you know what? If they found you, they found the right person, right, Therese? They want to get yeah. a job done. They go. They went and found you. Okay, great. Um, maybe one more question is: Of course, you were one of the first women, if not the first woman, on the Pittsburgh Police Department. Uh, you know, you know, a lot more women have, I think, started working in the police on the police force in Pittsburgh and elsewhere. Nineteen seventies into the nineteen eighties. Um, how did how did you uh, were you a mentor to these uh, women? How how did you, how did you um, show them the ropes? Well, uh, I was one of the mo- and I was instrumental in making it miss- possible for women to come on, and mm. uh, I had a lot to say about them. I would attend classes and uh, their classes, and I would lecture them, and and uh, I can always uh, remember how respectful they were. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and just speaking to them, Ed, and, and when I interviewed them, for instance, Chief Cookie Coleman, who was Chief of Police of Wilkinsburg, uh, just just how Therese carried herself, how mm-hmm. she handled herself in certain mm-hmm. situations at the office. They, it's all in the documentary, honestly. They yeah. admired her and respected 
respected her so much for that. And so I think it, it was a true mentoring process that she was calm, collected, knew how to handle the men. You know, so mm-hmm. she really, really, Kathy McNeely, uh, who was Chief McNeely's wife uh, later on uh, during the course of uh, history, she she was the same way. These women have risen. Linda, uh, Commander Linda Barone right now on the force. These women credit her for their ability yeah. to rise to the positions they have. Yes. Wow. I have, I yeah. have to really be yeah. very uh, concerned about the respect that these women gave. Yeah. And here's an interesting little yeah. tidbit too, because she fought for, this is early on now, she fought for the women to go to, to attend the police academy. Early in her career, the women were just brought on, they mm-hmm. became police officers, but they were never permitted to attend the police academy. No. She worked with uh, Eugene Kuhn at the time, and she worked with, he could not believe this, because she was teaching at the academy, and she had not even mm-hmm. attended it. <laughs> uh, uh. Therese, could you ever, you know, when you started in the 1940s, could you have ever imagined the way your career went to the point where you're mentoring these other women, and, you know, they're thanking you, you know, for their careers, you know, you, you know, blazing the trail that they've now followed. Could you have ever imagined that when you started at age 18? No. No. Mm-hmm. It must, no I, uh, yeah. I would never have imagined that it would have uh, uh, eventually have come to what it came to. Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing when you started in the 19, you know, your career, that you didn't suspect way down the road that you'd be writing a, a book and they'd be making a movie about you, right? <laughs> no. Never. Okay. And uh, I do credit her for writing that memoir, Ed, because that was the basis for the documentary. Yeah. I mean, there's so many cases that she covers in this book. And believe me, if you go down to her mm. file cabinet and you see all the cases she handled, you, you yeah. cherry-pick the cases that you wanted to really discuss right. in the book. With yeah, you can come to my home now, and I have a cabinet in my basement. <laughs> that looks like the wow, well, I, I might just do that. Being that I can't get my hands you're on welcome. some of these files, I might have to go there personally. <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome anytime you okay. want to come. All right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to I'm going to seriously take you up on that. I appreciate that. Uh let's just talk about the book because we want uh people to check out uh your book, uh Therese Rocco, uh this memoir. You know, what was the um the motivation for uh uh you know, publishing it, starting down to write it. You know, most of as you know, most police officers don't end up writing their memoirs. What what motivated you to do so? I just like to write, mm-hmm. and uh, I would sit uh, in the evenings. I would sit uh, at, at my table, my dining room table, and I scribble and I'd write. And I was amazed at uh, mm-hmm. what I had in my mind. I was recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she she did it all by hand yeah. over time, and she wrote chapter by chapter, and then sought out a good publisher as well as a. Uh, a good editor. And, yeah, uh, got to get those. I, I mean, and, it's, and Ed, it's really an interesting read. I, I know, I've read it. Now. I have it. I have it on my uh, Kindle. I got it back in 2018 when I knew I was going to be speaking to Therese back then. So, and yeah, I've read it. How she recalled all these, well, you're a good investigator. You recalled so many details mm. about individuals, the color of their hair, the way they walk, the way they talk. Therese was just, it just blew me away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you I got. Paid attention to people. Yeah. And then someone would say, "What were they wearing?" She had a green. I think she had a green sweater on. I don't mm-hmm. know. I said, "I remember. I don't know." My vision just collected it. Yeah, that's that's what you talked about being a great investigator, and like you said, it, you, you once you started doing it, you it felt like it was something that you were meant to do, and your mind went very well with it. Mm-hmm. Right. You may recall this, but she appeared before the Senate in 1985 and uh, really uh, helped change a lot of the um, legalization Mm. about missing children because Mm. there were a lot of organizations that were frauds that were helping families find their children. So her... By her testifying, they really, really changed that at that time and were able to shut that mm-hmm. down. That, that families and individuals had to work directly with the police prior to contacting these organizations. Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. 
Um, what I will say here is if you are interested, I'm speaking to the listeners now, if you are interested in more uh, cases that Chief uh, uh, Therese Rocco investigated and solved, please find her memoir on Amazon. I guess it's both in ebook and print form. Correct, Therese? Yeah. All right. And it's called Therese Rocco. Is there some sort of subtitle to that, Therese Rocco? The subtitle is Pittsburgh's First Female Assistance Police Chief. Wow, okay. Now we know the nation. Now we know the nation. <laughs> okay. All right. So if you're interested in a read, I know a lot of people, my listeners, take it, uh, love true crime books. This is one to check out an actual investigator working on um, missing persons cases, uh, including the one, of course, uh, we talked about today. We talked about two, but one primarily, Marianne Verdecchia's. And as far as Sharon, a, a documentary of Teresa, uh, Teresa's life is also available titled The Epitome of Grace, The Life of Therese Rocco. And, and, and the listeners should know Therese spells her name T-H-E-R-E-S-E. -E. She's not a Teresa. She's a Therese, Therese Rocco. And you can find this uh, documentary. You can find it on the website, The Epitome of Grace. That's T-H-E-E-P-I-T-O-M-E-O-F-G-R-A-C-E dot -E -E com or on Google Play. Uh, Therese, and, Therese and Sh uh, Sharon, any final words before we complete this interview? Well, we just appreciate the fact that you've given us the time to... You know, keep Marianne's memory and her investigation alive. And actually, this afternoon, we are going to be meeting with some Pittsburgh police detectives who wow. are coming here to uh, reopen the case with us. So it is wow. still alive and active. Wow. How do you feel about that, Teresa? It's hard to believe 60 years later. Of oh, course. I, I feel terrific. Yeah. Well, I, I'm still very active. I and can tell. I'm very grateful to the Almighty God that my mind <laughs> is. Perfect. Yeah, I, I, fact, you know, it's just this is interesting. Three years ago, uh, when they they found a body uh, under a patio slab, and mm -hmm. you brought up Marcella, which is uh, which is interesting as well. They, she was still active, and the detectives came to Teresa's house asking about the Marcella Krolls case because. From what they could determine, these re these remains were around the same time. Yeah. Do you know Therese had her dental record in the wow. file? She was able to turn it over to the detective. He took a picture, got it to the lab mm -hmm. within her. Within 20 mm -hmm. minutes, they knew that the wow. body was not Marcellus. And that I was able to identify that mm -hmm. body. Yes, mm -hmm. you actually identified that body because you knew that individual. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, wow, that's fascinating. Uh, like I said, uh, sh I I've read the book, listeners, uh, and I'm not getting, uh, as the listeners know, I don't get paid to uh, publicize, market other people's products or anything, uh, but I'm telling you, I've read the book, you should get it, and uh, you know, she's a fascinating woman, and it's, uh, Therese, it's so great to talk to you again after, I guess it's been four years, and I hope we get to talk again soon, and I may just take you up on heading to your house to look at those files. I mean, just, sir, you're welcome to come here anytime you want. Okay. Just let I, us know and make sure that my two friends here are here. Okay, so I hope. happy to help you. you All right, great. A plethora of missing person files. Great. Well, both of you, uh, and I know Marianne's friend there, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to you too much, but uh, thank you for joining us today, sitting in, uh, representing uh, your longtime missing friend, Marianne. Thank you as well. Um, Thank you. You're very welcome, and I appreciate all of you being on this episode of Unfound. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. You're welcome. And that was my February 9th, 2022 interview with Therese Rocco, former investigator for the Pittsburgh Police Department, and Sharon Leotis, the creator of the documentary on Therese's career and life. I thank them both for joining me and all of you on this episode. And thanks to Marianne's friend who provided moral support to both during the interviews. As I stated before this interview started, it's probably not what you've come to expect from Unfound. But you don't think I'm going to pass up a chance to talk to a person like Therese Rocco, do you? She could be talking about anything, and I would listen. And I thank Sharon for making it all happen. 
Before I get into my summation, I want to remind all of you to find Teresa's book, Therese Rocco, on Amazon. Also, please find the documentary, The Epitome of Grace, at Google Play. $3.99 to rent, $6.99 to buy. Both the book and film are spectacular. Now, what do I think about these two disappearances and the murder? If Therese Rocco says the three are not connected, I'm inclined to believe her. And really, from just a demographics point of view, I can see why they wouldn't be related. We have a 45-year-old wife, a 30-year-old single woman, and a 10-year-old girl. If we go further, Mary was known to step out on her husband. Marcella seemingly had no men in her life at all. And Marianne, she was 10. Even further, I think it's conceivable that Mary might have been a sex worker just like Jean Emery was. This would make the list of suspects very long. Marcella, there's no proof she disappeared from the apartment. For all we know, she got picked up on the street by someone. And for Marianne, if we are to believe the building manager, he saw her leave. Even, even further, for all three, yes, they didn't have the scientific techniques and technical advances that we have now, but I have to believe if some guy caused all three of these, that Therese and the other investigators would have put the dots together and caught the guy. Pretty sure. Then Ed, are you saying the location is just a coincidence? I think what I'm saying is we must look at all three, even though one is a murder, the way we always look at disappearances. I don't want to do too much theorizing, but for Mary, her husband said he left for several hours and when he came back, Mary was dead. Now, if Mary had disappeared while he was gone, we know what we would think. Something to consider. For Marcella, I found a 1958 article where she was in the hospital for two weeks. I found another from 1954 where her family or someone actually put in the newspaper that she was flying to New York for a vacation. I found an article from 1942 where her family put in the paper that Marcella got her tonsils out. I also found a 1948 article where it was announced Marcella completed her secretarial course. Here's what I think I know. It wasn't Marcella who was airing all her private stuff in the newspaper. Also something to consider. As for Marianne, let us remember that what we in the 21st century call the good old days were really the bad old days. No Amber Alerts, no tracking of pedophiles. There was that uncle who was uh, a little too touchy with kids, who was dismissed as just being friendly. And I will even go as far as to say that due to birth stats being much better now than they were back then, women having babies in hospitals and not so much at home, I've personally convinced myself that a lot of children back then disappeared a lot more than we will ever realize. But the big question for Mary Ann's disappearance is, do you believe the building manager saw her leave the Martinique or not? This is a guy who some true crime forum members seem to suspect in all three of these cases. On one hand, this sighting sure is convenient given that it releases from suspicion everyone at the Martinique, including himself. On the other hand, since Marianne went over to the Martinique all the time, why did someone choose to harm her this day and not any other? Trying to answer that question could lead us to think she really did walk across the street and something happened elsewhere. I'll leave you with this. Would anyone have the guts to create three separate mysteries over four years that could be connected to the fifth floor of any building. 
Would that person not worry about getting caught given the repetition of his actions? I'll leave the theorizing up to you. And that's the program. If you found it informative, please go to the app that you use to listen to Unfound and give this podcast a nice review. I thank you for listening. I'm Ed Densel, and you've been listening to Unfound.